the notes. And uh, we know how to take the derivative of stuff to a power. Like the derivative of x to the fifth is 5x to the fourth. But obviously, there are a heck of a lot more functions in the world besides just polynomials. That's just the powers. There are d and sine and cosine and natural log and arc tangent and composite functions and fractions. And, oh, there's so many. So, derivatives, the power rule is great, but it's only one kind of derivative at a time. So, today you're going to learn four more, and I'm going to tell you only one of them. And you're going to come up with the other three by the phone. Uh, I will, however, give you a way to figure it out yourself. So, here we go. You can always figure out where a derivative comes from by looking at slopes. Is there nothing in here? What's going on? Is this what you have here? Yeah. Okay, cool. Now then, um, this is what we're going to do together. Then you're going to do the other three by yourself. Given the graph of sine, which I gave you, let's sketch the derivative directly below. My goal being to say, what's the derivative of sine? Well, let's start at zero. If I draw a tangent line, derivative is a tangent line, yeah? If I draw a tangent line there and record the numerical value of the slope, what does it look like the slope is? Go back. One, I agree, okay? So when x is zero, the slope is one. So at the same x of zero, I'm going to record the slope as the outcome. So there. Slope is 1, gets recorded there, yeah? Let's go to this point. It's between 1 and 2. What is it, really? Where's the peak of sine? 5 and 2. 5 and 2 is 3.14 is over 2. So what is that, really? Uh, 1.57. So you see where that's coming from. I didn't use a radian scale, but it's, uh, it's pi over 2. You with me? So at pi over 2, what's the tangent slope there? Zero. So same at the same point, at about x of 1.5-ish or so, record a slope of zero. Again, at the same x, so directly below, on, as the y value you're recording, what's the slope there? Right? What about at this point? What's, what do you reckon that is just past 3? And what does the slope look like at pi? Negative 1. So at pi, directly below an x of pi, the slope is negative 1. And what about this guy here? Where's the minimum of sine usually? The min of sine is usually 3 pi over 2. And what does it look like the slope is there? Okay, let's do one more. Go over here to negative pi over 2. What's the slope there? 0. So at negative pi over 2 or negative 1.57, the slope is 0. Cool. And we could record at negative pi, the slope is about what? Negative 1. And if I start to connect my slopes, it seems like the derivative of sine is cosine. That's so cool. Now that makes total sense. The slopes are periodic. They go up and down, up and down. So of course the derivative is periodic, cosine. Um, would you try, isn't there a, oh yeah, go beneath it. Is this on the same, is it on the front of the yeah, we can do this one next, because this one makes sense. If the derivative of sine is cosine, then it will make sense that the derivative of cosine is sine. And of course, that's not right. So try it anyway. If you're not clear on what you should be doing, I think I'm going to be trying to estimate the slope and record it in right below.
that about what your slopes are looking like? So you would say that the derivative of cosine is? Negatives. Negatives. All right. Do you get the process of uh, trying to figure out what a derivative is based on what the slope pattern looks like? That's your goal, to then use that to find the other two. So you go through together or by yourself. I want you to dis discover what's the derivative of e? What's the derivative of log? Talk it over. We'll go over them to make sure you have it right in your notes. And about a couple of five minutes. So for log, did you get, first of all, understand the absolute value. I know I, I just kind of threw that out there, but it's typical that sometimes it says that straight up natural log, which would just be the right side of the graph, they use in calculus especially log the absolute value. And the reason they do that is so that you can put the negative down and calculate from that. Uh, so when that absolute value is there, it allows you to graph right and left and then see the graph a little better. Uh, what does that look like? 
Yeah, 1 over x. It's the 1 over x graph. The natural log derivative is 1 over x. All right. Um, e. I hope that you saw on the left side some pretty flat slopes. Like at negative 2, it looks like about negative 1 half, yeah? Maybe the slope there is pretty flat. Are you with me? And at 1, or sorry, at x equals 0, the graph looks like it has a slope of about 1. And at x equals 1, the slope looks like it's about eh, 1.2.7. Um, and over here, it's getting really steep, and so that's a really big number. And so the graph of the derivative looks like that. What does that look like? Yeah, the derivative of e to the x is itself. There is one function in all the world of functions that is its own derivative, and that's e. And that makes it awesome. Okay, now then, um, we'll do some practice on this and just actually jump to this real quick then. Would you uh, flip it over and don't look at it? So what's the derivative of sine? Derivative of cos, what's the derivative of cos? X, what's the derivative of e to the x? To the x. What's the derivative of derivative of natural log? Okay. Well, so would you give that a go? That uh, practice of just uh, a of those uh, using today's and yesterday's coefficient ideas together. Gotcha. Did you ever have 2e to the 2 is 2e to the 2, right? No. 2e to the 2 is a constant. And the derivative of a constant is 0. All right? So what if I took, if I have to the derivative of 2e to the x, what is that derivative? 3e to the x. That's a function. The derivative of 2e to the x. But 2e squared is a constant. All right. What about 3 sine of x? Uh, that's a function. What's the derivative? 3 cosine of x. What's the derivative of 7 cosine of x? Negative 7 sine of x. What's the derivative of negative natural log? That's like a negative 1 coefficient. Negative 1 over x. Okay, the negative is just like a coefficient. The sine stays the same. And I, at least mentally, would make a power rule problem out of that. How do you do the derivative of x to the half? Half comes down, drop it by one, so that's something like three x, uh, three halves x to the negative one half. I imagine I could also write that as the square root of x in the denominator would be also excellent. All right, what about the derivative of two? Zero. All right. So obviously those zeros could be left out, but uh, that's a good point. All right. Now there's one more thing you really have to understand. Um, pre calc students definitely think oh, ratings are so so. I hate ratings. Ratings are awesome. Let me make very, one thing very clear to you, okay? A note about calculus and trig. Uh, when we discovered the derivative of cosine was sine, um, the graph was in radians. You can see radians are smaller scale numbers, you know? I, although they're pi over 2e and ugly, at least they're kind of like a one-to-one -one scale between x and y. You know, the numbers are relative to the same magnitude. You follow me? Okay, now let's consider degrees. If I graphed cosine in degrees first, then yes, at zero, zero degrees or zero radians, cosine is still cosine of zero natural. Now the second point. Cosine, if I'm graphing in degrees, then the next good point is cosine of 90, yeah? 90 degrees. And on this scale, then, 90 degrees would be way over 
like in Mrs. LeBlanc's room. You with me? And so to get to the x-axis, that would, I mean, I would be, it would almost be imperceptibly blasted because it's not going to get to the axis until way over there. You track it. All right. And over here, it's not going to get to the axis, x axis, but way over there. So if you were to graph that in degrees, it would almost look like a line. Now, that said, okay, great. The slope is still zero at zero. This is the derivative. Okay? But at 90, when I get to 90, is that slope going to be 1? Or is it going to be really, really flat? I mean, are these slopes kind of microscopically small? And actually negative. So my point is this. Does that kind of look like, oh, now it's the derivative of cosine of sine? And the answer is no, right? This is the deal. The derivative of cosine is sine only when you are in radians. If I say, hey, what's the derivative of cosine when you're in degrees? You say, I don't know, because it's not sine. It's actually sine times pi divided by 180, but roughly 160. Um, but we'll talk more about that in chain rule. My point is this. You all calculus is in radians. Always. All the time. 100%. Okay? All calculus derivatives of trig depends on being in radians. I don't, maybe I just ignored my own notes right there, but you get the idea. Okay? It's got to be radians, or the scale is just totally whack, and the derivative rules that we want to use, derivative of cosine and sine, are out the door, or negative sine. This isn't it negative sine? Sorry, my bad. Okay, you follow? You know, I'm with you, Mr. Wilson. Oh, good. Right. Uh, that's my impression of your voice right now. It's real high pressure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Questions about last night's homework. First of all, a couple of replacement problems. Uh, how does the old homework go? And I have a nice little group of regulars every morning coming up for questions. I love that. Uh, feel free to join us. Um, 11 was a replacement. What did you get for A? Or actually, I found B first. What did you get for B in number 11? Super duper. Oh, super duper. And what did you get for A? Super duper. Super duper. Excellent. Uh, would you like to see where that's coming from and what the work should look like? Okay, cool. If you are to show, if you're given that it needs to be continuous, then obviously F has to be defined at 0, 1. And I feel like they are doing that. Um, it's not a proof of continuity, so I'm not going to show the kind of proof continuity stuff. I'm going to use the, especially the middle part of continuity. The middle part of continuity is that the one-sided limits have to be the same, all right? So wouldn't you agree that if this is going to be continuous, the limit as x approaches 0 from the left, which uses what function? 3 minus x, ax plus b, or r prime of x. 3 minus x has to equal the limit as x approaches 0 from the right, which uses which branch? ax plus b. Now I'm going to pause and work with that a little. If I direct substitute x going into 0, then the left side seems like as this gets closer and closer to 0, this approaches 3. As this gets closer and closer to 0, the a term would get dropped, smaller and smaller dropping out, and you're left with just the B. So right away I see that B has to be 3 for it to be continuous at 0. Now I'm going to go to continuous at 1 to help me find A. The limit as X approaches 1 from the left uses what branch? X plus B. And I might as well put in the B now. So I'm going to say X plus 3 instead. I, although you could keep doing it if you like. The limit as X approaches 1 from the right uses which branch? Our sign of x. Now again, direct substitute. At 1, what does the line approach? As x goes to 1, by direct substitution, this is just a times 1 plus 3, or a plus 3, yeah? And the right side, 
What is arc sine of one? It's pi over two. Sine is one at an angle of pi over two. Therefore, A is pi over two. That's what good work should look like. Um, just so we're clear how they would grade this on the test. If you just have floating algebra, like this is very common. People will just often do this kind of stuff. You'll get credit, uh, not full credit, because I mean, you're stopping your limits. You're just writing bad math. Okay? And that bothers me. Okay, uh, 14. I have is replacement. Okay? Uh, what's the process of telling what kind of graph this is? What, what do you do? I heard somebody say square. square it. Yeah, square it. Rearrange it a little bit. And then make the call and say, what conic is it? What half? So what conic is it? Circle, what half? Top half. All right. Uh, square it. Rearrange it. Uh, I typically like the, the constant to be positive. Right, nope. So I get x squared minus y squared equals 4, yeah? Uh, what kind of figure? Hyperbola sideways or vertically opening? So, uh, if it's x squared minus y squared, you, that's how you need that 4 to be a positive. If you do this, it's tempting to say vertical, but this is negative. Um, think about it like this. Uh, can, can you put in an x of 0 here? Can that be solved? No. All right. X can't be zero, so it's not this, because there can be no points that satisfy that. You'd have to choose y's to be zero. Only that would work. So it's not vertically opening. It's sideways opening. And focus on making that constant. You ha it has to be positive. Is it the whole hyperbola or only the top half? Top half. So it's let's do a little out. Uh, this guy, when you square it, y squared equals 9 minus 2x squared. Uh, 2x squared uh, plus y squared equals 9. I definitely didn't try and make this pretty. x squared plus y squared over 2 equals 9 halves. Uh, is that what I want to do? No, that's not going to form. Don't you want a 1 over there or something? I'm kind of rusty. x squared over 9 halves plus y squared over 9 equals 1. Uh, I just want you to know the graph. What is it? Uh, what kind of graph? It's an ellipse. Technically, it's a vertically stretched. That's more stretched vertically. This is maybe 2-ish and x. 3-ish. Definitely 3-ish and y. Uh, I wouldn't grade you for the accuracy of it, or I'd give you a pretty one. Uh, top half, bottom half. Top half. I got top half each time. I wish I would have done a bottom half. What would uh, make one of these a bottom half? Maybe they're going to find the root. Okay. Um, excellent. 16. Uh, is it, this is a shifted rational function or something, isn't it? Uh, yes. Alright, so y equals. 1 over x minus 3 plus 2. This is a good review of uh, graph transformation. How does the graph change? Shifted, stretched, reflected. Shifted how? Right 3, up 2. So let's think of the origin as right 3, up 2. I'm going to call this my new origin. And a graph of 1 over x is the old. That's called the rational function. It's also a hyperbola. Rotate it. Oops, and I graphed that terrible because that goes a vertical line there. Uh, it should look like that. It's not curving back away from the asymptote. It should approach the asymptote. All right, um, where is it increasing? No, it never increases. Not everything does. Um, what does that imply about the derivative? If the function's never increasing, then the slope is never positive, so the derivative is never positive. Yeah, there's a direct relationship between increasing and the sign of the derivative. We'll talk a lot about that this year. 
All right. Um, so that if the function is increasing, it's moving on the line squared, so the derivative is positive. Okay, cool. Uh, good question. There you go, Luke. All right, 22. Um, did you say, must there be a place where h is 2? Did you say yay, nay? And what was your justification? Okay, thanks for that feedback. I heard a lot of mumbles. Uh, is h continuous? Yes, let's... Uh, okay, can you say yes? Why do you say yes? Yeah, give it a thumbs up. I, I have no idea that H is continuous, so we will. Right. H is not necessarily continuous. So there doesn't necessarily, not necessarily, a point where h at c is 2. Uh, in other words, don't assume continuity. Read. Okay? Don't get lazy. Now, I don't actually know if that was my intention or not, quite frankly. So um, let's say that it had been given, just for the test practice, say if they had been given continuity. So if, you're, if you had that, you're good. Okay, let's just for the sake of practice just talk together. If you are given continuity, after that, you stated H is continuous, then what would you do? You would find H at the given point, 0 and 5. H at 0, slowly, is F of G of 0. G of 0 is 2, and F at 2 is negative 1. All right, then you'd find H at 5. That's F of G of 5. G of 5 is? Zero and f of zero is three. Must there, if it was given to be continuous, must there be a place where y is two or h is y or h is two? Yeah, going from negative one to three would have to. So it would have worked if they had been given continuity, but if not, well, you're not. Okay, twenty-three. Um, so. This is end behavior. Which wins? The top. Okay, so this is roughly negative x over 1. So as x goes to infinity, the graph goes to negative infinity. Okay, the next one, is it end behavior? It is not. When I try drag substitution, I get 0 over 0. That stinks, so what do I do? Factor it. 2 plus x, 2 minus x, 2 plus x goes whoosh. And now direct substitution, 2 minus negative 2 is 4. Okay? Last but not least, um, if you had that as x, so let me do the most visual. If I approach 2, the function approaches 3 over 0, then what does that imply? There's a asymptote. What kind of asymptote? A vertical asymptote. There is a vertical asymptote where? At more specific, not just at this. At x equals 2. Okay? Um, remember, infinite behavior means there's an asymptote, either horizontal or vertical, depending on if x is going to infinity or y is going to infinity. 24. What do I have there in that? Oh, I think that middle box is just direction for 24. Wow, I'm so lazy. I'm a waste. All right. Um, so the idea here, again, big ideas of calculus. It's secant slope, which is the slope between two points to estimate tangent slope. Slope between or change between two points to estimate slope at a point. Average rate of change to estimate instantaneous rate of change. All those are ideas that you're thinking through, okay? So your goal is to say, all right, what is this instantaneous rate of change like? Well, it's going to be like change between two points. Change in y over change in x. 
and your goal is to say, all right, select two points. Well, the, the rules of the game are you've got to take points as close as you can to the one they ask about. So if they ask, what's the rate of change at zero, what two x's are as close to zero as possible? So those two, so you're going to use those. Does it matter if I go f at zero minus f at two, or f at two minus f at zero, or it'll come out the same as long as I'm consistent top to bottom? It'll come out the same. All right, so if I go 2 minus 0 and 2 minus 0, then what's f at 2 minus f at 0 in the numerator? Negative 9 over 2. All right. Again, estimating using change between two points, which is the secret slope. Estimating tangent slope is secret slope. If I want to estimate 2, what two points are as close to 2 as possible? Three and two. Well, two is obviously that's as close as you can get. If you can use two, use two. How do you decide between zero on one side or three on the other? Yeah, which one's closer? Zero is two units away from what I want. Three is one unit away, so I should use three. So three and two, three and two, and so that's something like uh, six over one. Okay. And what about for f of 3? Should I use 2 and 3, 2 and 5, 3 and 5? 2 and 3, okay? f at 3 minus f at 2. So it's the same, yeah? It's the same. Okie dokie, cool. Uh, what about f minus 4, which got cut off? Which did you use? 5 and 3. What definition are you using? If you're approaching from both sides, you're using the symmetric definition. And then what'd you get? Negative one half? Three? Okay. Uh, other questions on set 25. Okay. From the book problem, if you have. Got them out. 20, go for it. All right, 20, here we go. Uh, 20, I didn't change anything. Here we go. 20 is. Uh, an identity, 2 cosine of x over sine of 2x. Uh, yeah, it's probably a little empty here. I can definitely see why. Okay, let's go here. Do you agree cosecant is the reciprocal of sine? Actually, let's go here. What's sine of 2x equal to? 2 sine of x cosine of x. So that'll be helpful. Uh, usually I never make more than one change per step. I definitely wouldn't allow you to do that in pre-calculus, but for now, let's go with it. Cosecant of negative x, cosecant is like sine, yeah? And x versus negative x says, what happens if you go up versus down? Is sine affected if you go up or down? Sine is the y side, yeah? Is y affected if you go up versus down? Yeah, in fact, you get the opposite result. And so sine of negative x is the opposite of the sine of normal x. Please don't say I pull the negative out front. That is not what's going on. Okay? Cosecant of negative x then is the same. Cosecant of negative x is the same as the opposite of cosine, cosecant of normal x. We? Cool. Uh, here, the cosine drops away, so we're left with 1 over sine of x. What should I do? Change the cosecant or change the sine? Change the sine. Sine in the denominator is the same as cosecant in the numerator. Boom. Okay. Other questions in 30 seconds or less? All right. Well, I'll be here at 7th hour. I'll be here after school. Uh, make sure I get your homework by the time I leave. I'll be about 4 or 4 Oh, the review. Shoot, sorry. Uh, the final review is optional. It's posted on my website right now. Obviously, you have two days more time to check the study. But those of you who are taking the test tomorrow, it's on the website. Uh, I'll have a key off at school. I don't have a key up here. But the key uh, review is on the website tonight. Okay? Have a great day.